Good evening and welcome to the second half of tonight's Science Week presentations by the Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences. And it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. James Hammond, who's going to be talking about his work on a volcano that spans North Korea and the Chinese border. One of the most complicated forms I have to sign off <laughs> as dean is the risk assessment for, from the Iron Shores of James's trips to North Korea. I signed this document and crossed my fingers, and hopefully by the end of this lecture I'll know quite how risky what he's doing is. But I know James has been doing some absolutely fascinating work both on the geology and also on the politics of the Korean Peninsula, which is obviously in a very interesting state. So I'm very much looking forward to James telling us about volcanoes on the Chinese border. Excuse, Nick. <coughs> Excuse me, my voice is going a little bit, so if I break up, uh, I apologise. Uh, I mean, a little bit of background about myself. I haven't always worked in places like Northern Korea, so my, my PhD was actually based in the Seychelles which involved me spending about six weeks uh, in a year uh, in, in the Seychelles, which you can imagine what drew me to that, uh, that PhD. And then from there I went to work in the Caribbean on uh, Montserrat, a volcano, um, which I had to spend Christmas and New Year at in Montserrat. And then from there I went to Ethiopia and Eritrea into the Danakil Depression, a really <coughs> remarkable place. Um, in terms of geology, and now I'm working in, in North Korea. So some people think my career has kind of gone in the wrong direction in, in terms of that. But for me, this is much more uh, a fascinating place to work, both scientifically, and I'll hopefully give you a bit of an insight into that uh, tonight, but also culturally and from a kind of a science diplomacy angle and uh, I'll, I'll also hopefully give you a bit of a flavor of what that's been like uh, in setting up a project with North Korea and as far as we're aware we're, on, we're one of the only well, at least long-lived scientific engagements with uh, North Korea uh, certainly in the last sort of 10 years or so. So why do we go to all this effort? Well volcanoes present a real hazard. So this is a map showing, the Red Triangle show uh, the locations of volcanoes that have erupted in the Holocene, which is basically in the last 12,000 years. And that's for what we as geologists consider, these are the ones we want to keep an eye on. Right? These are the ones that have the potential to erupt again. And about 200 million people worldwide live within about 30 kilometers of these volcanoes. If they were to erupt, be directly affected by them. And we all know that uh, when volcanoes erupt, they really affect the wider region through shutting down air travel, ship travel, and even on the biggest uh, scale, they can cause changes in global climate. So we really want to understand these systems and the risks and, and, uh, that, that they pose to people. But many volcanoes are very poorly understood. Right? There's a lot of them. And part of that is sometimes due to complex politics. And so this map in yellow shows all those countries that are under some form of international sanctions, implying that they're in some way isolated from the international community, or it certainly makes it more difficult to work there. And I just highlight a couple of examples of where I've worked. So Mount Pektu, which we're talking about tonight, and the China-North Korea border, but also Nagara Volcano, that sits on the border of Ethiopia and Eritrea. Right? Both of these are closed borders. In this case, uh, the country technically at war, although I read in the news today that, that there's been some very positive developments there that, that might soon come to an end. Right? So, but it's still imperative we study these volcanoes because there's people that live nearby, um, they, they, and if they erupt, they could have uh, consequences. 
So if we look at, uh, the, the main the, the talk's going to be about my practice, if we look at that a little bit more in detail, uh, as Nick mentioned, the volcano lies right on the border with China and North Korea. So this is the location here. Okay, DPRK, you'll see this a lot through my talk, the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. It's a formal name for North Korea. This is the border. And you can see this is the volcano. This is the caldera at the top. And the border actually runs right away through the middle of this caldera, complicating matters even more. And so this is a picture uh, of the caldera taken from North Korea looking into China. It's actually it's quite an interesting thing because you, we, we, we work a lot in this area. We take boats out on the lake, sampling hot springs and things like this. And you can see the lines of tourists standing up here, kind of taking photos of you as you, as you do this. Because this is a, maybe just us on this side. And then I think they get thousands of people a day going on the Chinese side. It's one of the kind of top tourist destinations. This is a picture taken from the International Space Station. And you can see this is this five kilometer wide caldera at the summit. So already you get it. And this was formed uh, in an eruption in 946 AD, right? So about a thousand or so years ago. Right, and you get a sense already that this must have been quite a big uh, eruption. This map here shows where they found ash from this eruption. And ash has been found in Japan and the Kuril Islands, and in fact, you can find it in Greenland ice cores. Right, so it's one of the reasons that this is a very uh, significant eruption with a lot of material um, ejected. These deposits here, uh, what we call pyroclastic flow deposits, okay, so this is a very thick uh, deposit. If you've seen the news, the uh, Fuego volcano that erupted in Guatemala recently. You'll see those images of pyroclastic flows. I have a little video of one here. This is from Unzen volcano in Japan. So basically what this is, is a cloud of a mixture of hot ash and rock that travels very rapidly down the valley. About 10 times bigger than all the things in the world. Within moments, this is normally a few hundred degrees centigrade and it can travel uh, uh, tens to hundreds of kilometers. How very uh, things. Very hard to outrun. In this case, I think they did manage to outrun this, uh, but very, very dramatic. Okay. Another uh, feature of the 946 AD eruption was these very big deposits that are called uh, from things called the Hearts. Okay, so again, I think they're seeing these in Fuego and Guatemala. This is a mixture where waters remobilize the ash. And again, it's a very fast flowing, destructive uh, feature. I've got another little video. This is again from Japan. I'll show what the volcano is. It's a very fast moving, destructive uh, And in this case, these lahars are found hundreds of kilometers away from the volcano. Right? This is uh, a rather uh, striking, uh, a bigger option. But how big was it? Right? So to put it into context, I'm just showing a, a few images from some eruptions that you uh, hopefully will have heard of, okay? just to, to see what, what size this eruption is. So the first one, uh, one go at trying to pronounce this. Okay? <laughs> this is uh, Ayaf Yakalukut uh, eruption in Iceland. Um, I'm sure many of you here were caught up in the, the troubles stuck somewhere in Europe or not able to go somewhere. Right, this was estimated to cause about $4.7 billion of impact on global GDP. But this was quite a small eruption. It's estimated to be a four on something we rank eruptions called the Volcanic Explosivity Index, which is based on the amount of stuff, the amount of material that is erupted, uh, right? and it's about 0.3 cubic kilometers. Or in something a bit more tangible, there'd be enough material to bury Greater London to a depth of about 20 centimeters. So it's a, it's a fair amount of material, but on the grand scheme of things, this is quite small, 
the context Fuego in Guatemala, I think, was even smaller, about a magnitude three, the year I think. And if we go up the scale to one, this is, uh, if we look at the eruption of Vesuvius, right? This is the eruption in 79 AD. This is the one that buried uh, Pompeii, right? And the spectacular World Heritage Site. This is estimated to be a five, but an order of magnitude more material, 3.3 cubic kilometers, or enough to bury Greater London to a depth of about two meters. We start to look at some of the really big eruptions now. This is Krakatoa in 1883. The eruption destroyed about two thirds of the island, generated huge tsunamis, killed tens of thousands of people. This erupted about 20 cubic kilometers of material, PEI 6, and now enough to bury Greater London in about 13 meters of ash, right? So you lose all the buildings with the gherkins sticking out the top. And then if we go right to the top of the pile, we look at Tambora, just about 200 years ago. This is the largest eruption in human history, right? The largest eruption humans have witnessed about 100,000 fatalities. This was so big, it injected so much stuff and gases, and, and in particular sulfur, into the atmosphere that it caused a one degree centigrade temperature drop globally, relatively short lived. But it was enough to cause a year and a summer and widespread famine across Europe and North America. And um, people have even linked this to civil unrest and changes in society during that time, right? So volcanoes can have a really big impact uh, on the bigger scale. This is enough, this is enough material erupted from this to bury London to a depth of about 100 meters. Huge amount of uh, material. So question, where do we think the millennium, the 946 AD eruption, where do we think that sits on this scale? Uh, how many people think it was similar to Aya Yakalopit? No one? Vesuvius? Okay, a few hands. Krakatoa, a few more. Tambora, just a couple. Right? The 946 AD eruption is comparable in size to Tambora. Right? Enough material to bury London to 61 meters. It's a VEI 7. Right? It's in fact probably ranks as one of the top five eruptions in terms of size in the last few thousand years. Right? It's a big volcano. <laughs> And this is a big eruption. Okay. Yet we know very little about this volcano. Now, on a fundamental level, we don't even know why it's there. Right? It's not even—it's not on a plate boundary. Right? So there's huge questions that exist about this volcano. Why are we interested in it now? Well, there's recent signs of unrest. Right? The volcano is showing some signs of life. This plot here from uh, uh, our colleagues in China shows the number of earthquakes recorded on a, in, in, in a given month. Okay. And so you can see that normally we expect to see a handful, maybe 10, up to 10 earthquakes in a month. That's quite normal. Okay. But for about a period of three years, there was a, about a two order magnitude increase in the number of volcanoes peaking at about 243 earthquakes in uh, November 2008. And these were all located directly beneath the caldera itself. There is deformation, right? So essentially the ground, you, could, we can, you can measure the ground, the ground level very accurately, and it was, in, it was going up, right? So imagine you're blowing a balloon up, right? And it swells, the volcano is essentially doing that. There was an increase in the gases that were coming out from the volcano. Right? And this all pointed to a system that was being recharged. Right? So there's magma from depth coming into the system and recharging some shallow kind of volcanic plumbing system. Right? So this caused the dramatic history, the signs of unrest, caused quite a lot of um, uh, commotion locally, particularly in China, on the Korean Peninsula, Japan, um, places like that. And there was a big effort to monitor this, particularly in China and in North Korea. 
Now, on the back of that, the North Koreans kind of reached out, um, uh, or put a call out for some international collaboration to work together to understand uh, this volcano. And myself and a colleague from Cambridge, Clive Oppenheimer, you know, we, it kind of filtered down to us, and we jumped at the chance. We had about one week notice, right, and we picked up a bit, they asked us to bring a bit of kit, so we grabbed a bit of kit, and we got on a plane, and we flew out to uh, North Korea. And it was, in fact, my first day at Imperial College was me handing in an expense claim for my trip to North Korea. So you can imagine how that went down there. <laughs> um, but we went there, and we didn't really know what to expect. And a plane had been chartered, and they flew us up to the volcano. And they took us on a tour of their uh, volcano observatories. And we told them the first Western scientists ever to visit these observatories. Uh, so we looked at some of their equipment, and they took us to some of the sites, and it's really remarkable. This material that Clive is kneeling on, this is the stuff that was erupted in 946 AD. And you can see the trees that were alive during that time, and in fact, you can still see the bark on some of these trees. They're so well preserved. And in, in, in a study that I'm not going to talk about, we actually um, used some of these trees, much bigger ones, to date the eruption. That's why we know it happened in... 946 AD. Another thing we learned was how important this volcano is to the Korean people. And I don't just mean the North Koreans, but all Korean people. And it really is embedded within their culture. And in North Korea, you see it's really tied to the leaders. Um, in the Kim Il Sung uh, had his bases there during the fighting against the Japanese. Kim Jong Il is uh, uh, supposed to have been born there and they, they have this camp, it's called the secret camp. It's not very secret and that it's a big kind of tourist attraction and this is the, the thing here and, and everyone will be uh, expected to, to visit that. Or they make pilgrimages to the top. Or he you can see the statues in Pyongyang of Kim Il Sung and Kim Jong, Jong Il with, with this huge mosaic of the, the volcano behind them. But also, it's, it's very symbolic to the South Korean people. This is a stand in South Korea with the volcano. The volcano is mentioned in the national anthems of both countries. Okay, so it's the highest point on the Korean uh, peninsula. Just as a little bit of uh, interest, this is a little movie taken from something called Arirang. This is the mass gymnastics that the North Koreans put on. And here you can see a scene of the sun rising over Mount Heptu, and I'll play it to you. But this is a really remarkable scene. This is uh, hundreds of dancers and gymnasts here. But you'll see a picture form at the back here. This is done by people flipping cards, basically, to create these moving images. But it gives you a sense, again, that this is like the opening scene of this uh, Thing is, is it captures really in the heart of, of that whole culture. But during this meeting, we kind of all got together and as scientists, and we put an impromptu workshop, right? We got a projector, we got a screen, uh, and we, Clive and I, gave a few presentations about volcanoes that we've worked on around the world, and we asked them to present about Mount Pectu and what they thought the big questions were. And over about five days that we had together, we just discussed that science the whole time. And we soon found that there was a lot of common ground. There was a lot of things that we both wanted to find the answer to, right? And so by the end of it, we'd had the core of a proposal, of a research. 
Uh, and this is what we were going to work on. We wanted to image the crust and mountain beneath the volcano. We wanted to know where melt the magma was and, and, and what the current state of the volcano was. Uh, we wanted to look at the what happened during the 9th or 6th AD eruption. I call it the millennium eruption. Okay? This is a bit like being a forensic scientist. right? You can take the rocks that were erupted and you can pull apart those rocks, either in the laboratory or by <coughs> looking at the, the structures in the field, and you can understand what the volcano was like just before it erupted, and you can understand what happened during that eruption. And that's really important if you want to think about what might happen again in the future. We wanted to initiate discussions concerning the risk of the future volcanic activity. Right? How do you mitigate if the volcano were to erupt again and provide training in Pyongyang and in the UK on all of these matters. Now I'm going to talk about this one in this talk because this is what my area of research is, uh, but I'm happy to talk about others uh, later. Now setting this up was a challenge. Right? You know, normally you come away with a research proposal, you get a bunch of scientists together, you write back, if you're extremely lucky, you get it funded, and then you get on with the uh, research. But this was a rapidly changing time on the Korean Peninsula. When I first went there, Kim Jong-il was still in power. And then uh, Kim Jong-un uh, rose to power soon after that. There was nuclear tests, missile satellite launches, missile launches, increased in the US-South Korean military exercises. And this all led to international sanctions being imposed. And so we actually got it funded pretty quickly. But then it took two years of negotiation with the UK, US governments, international governments to actually put this into practice. And so this relatively small project with a bunch of scientists here internationally and here in North Korea that wanted to work together, we had to develop this rather complicated network involving learned bodies, so AAAS, the American Association of Advanced Science, and the, in, in Washington and the Royal Society here in London, which allowed us to talk more effectively with governments uh, about what we were doing. And then the other challenge we had is communication. It's not really possible for us to communicate directly with our North Korean scientists unless we're uh, actually sitting together. So we, have, we work with an NGO based in uh, Beijing, with an NGO-like organization based in Pyongyang that are set up for communication to travel through. So I'm not going to bore you with the details of it, but to give you a sense uh, that it was uh, uh, not an easy thing to uh, set up. It required some uh, flexibility. And ultimately, it meant we had to kind of become diplomats, right, for the want of a better word. I mean, there was a lot of discussion, right? a lot of talking, a lot of meetings uh, like this in Pyongyang, explaining what we were doing, you know, what was our motivation. And it was all about establishing trust and a relationship. Right? And it was the same here in the UK, talking with the, with the governments in the US, you know, again communicating um, what we wanted to do and convincing them that everything is about these core scientific aims, which is understanding this volcano. And we did that through this flexibility. We managed to sign all these agreements in Beijing. And this is one document, right? Sign it in Beijing, in Pyongyang, in London, these meetings in Berlin, in Paris. It was, it was a real, you know, uh, a big effort putting this together. But we did that. I mean, they managed to, Clive and I, managed to get back out to uh, North Korea. This is our Tupolev jet that we, uh, from the uh, North Korean airline, Air Korea. Uh, another picture of it. But importantly, we could take out all of our equipment. Right? This is what it's all about. And we managed to get permission to take six seismometers, four band seismometers, um, to uh, North Korea. And the objective was to deploy an array of seismometers like this, right? So each one of these red dots is where we would deploy one of these seismometers. This is about 60 kilometers long profile. And rather simply, what we wanted to know is 
What's the cross like directly beneath the volcano? Right, where we think things are happening, melt is coming into the crust, compared to this area over here where we hypothesize that not much is going on. Right, this is a normal continental uh, crust. Right, so we have this nice uh, linear array. A few pictures from the field. So here we are working with the colleagues in the Earthquake Administration and, uh, and, and one person from Pintec. Uh, which is the, the, the kind of logistical side of things. And the Koreans really did a remarkable job. They built these kind of houses for uh, seismometers. And I honestly say these are the best seismometers I've ever deployed. You know, I deployed them in, in apart from Alma Demons, obviously. But I've deployed these in Ethiopia and the Caribbean and all over the world, but these were phenomenal. And these are really important, actually, because in the winter, the volcano uh, looks quite different. Right? So this is in October, actually. Um, and I had to go out there on one trip. And normally, you can drive to the top, but we had to walk about three hours on this trip because the, the road is impassable. Um, it's about minus 10 uh, that day. Here you can see, this is on the volcano looking east. You can see all the small cones in the volcanic activity here. And in places, the snow drifts were pretty deep. We had to pull out one of the Korean colleagues who fell in. Um, and so close to the volcano, it was pretty simple because the, uh, the, the North Koreans had their volcano observatories. But as we moved further away from the volcano, um, they didn't have any infrastructure, like as in their own volcano observatory infrastructure. So again, this is where these negotiations come in, establishing that trust and that relationship, is we were allowed to deploy these stations in normal North Korean farmers' homes. Right? And this was, turned out this was quite a big deal. Some of these villages have never seen Westerners before. And in fact, out of our whole group, I was the only person allowed there because it was such a sensitive thing to do. They wanted to minimize that contact. But through that communication of what we were trying to achieve scientifically, the North Korean uh, government were, were happy with that. And so in these stations, this is in the potato field belonging to the village. We deploy our little kind of uh, uh, vault in the ground, our seismometer and everything would go in here. And the solar panels would go on this person's roof, batteries inside. So again, during that winter months, it's something to look after, make sure it runs uh, through the winter. And then here's just one other example from a place called Pak Samri, the most beautiful, wonderful family that we came across. They would cook us lunch every time we went there um, and we watched Russian movies in their, in, their, in their house. Again, solar panels on the roof. Um, and in this case, uh, Sazmonov would be down this little um, alleyway here. And they kindly provide their own security as well. <laughs> Um, we also collected a huge amount of geological samples of the millennium eruption. So, you know, exploring the area around the uh, volcano. Um, these are some of the deposits from the millennium eruption, quite close to tens of meters thick. And this is Clive uh, Kayla Yacobino, who uh, was an American, again, showing that, you know, there's very much an openness for this kind of engagement. Slight attention to it. And Kim Ju Song is an excellent geologist in the administration. And what they're looking at here, I think you can't really can't see it, but right at the bottom of this is some organic material. And again, this is what was on the forest floor in 946 AD. And so by looking at this deposit and what happened as we go this way, we can see what the different stages of that eruption were and how that eruption evolved. Not all work. All right, so we actually had a really good time when we were out there. This was my birthday party. It's my, birth, my birthday watermelon down here. You can see how popular I am on my <laughs> birthday, uh, for my birthday breakfast. Um, but we had a nice game of volleyball and then a pretty big party in the evening. And lots of the, the local speciality is blueberry wine, which is basically vodka with blueberries in it. Um, as far as I can tell, very nice. There's a lot of singing, a lot of dancing, a 
a lot of blueberry wine. It's, it's good fun. I love to see what to see. So what do we want to do with the data, right? And ultimately, this, this is what we want to do with our volcano, right? So I'm sure a few of you have been unfortunate enough to go for a CT scan, right? This rather unpleasant procedure at the hospital. And they put you in this tube. And basically what happens is an X-ray source kind of moves around and fires X-rays into your body, right? And it's recorded on the other side how much gets through, right? Depending on what it goes through, and how much the body is absorbed depends on what the material inside is. And if we can fire it from enough different directions, right, and record it on the other side, you can build up an image of where the absorbent bits are, where the less absorbent bits are, and we end up with an image of, in this case, well, unpleasantly, someone's bowels. Okay? And we want to do the same thing, but on a volcano. But obviously, we can't build a big CT scan to image inside the volcanoes. Although some people are trying with neutrinos now, which is, which is rather neat. But what we can look for is a different source of energy that travels through the volcano, and we can record that in a different way. And the source we use is earthquakes. Okay? So when an earthquake happens, right, it's a rather dramatic event. This is a picture of it's a picture of a whole series of earthquakes in uh, Ethiopia uh, that form this kind of little, little graven here. Right, but it releases energy traveling into the earth in the form of sandworks. Right? And these earthquakes happen all over the world, all the time. Right? You know, there's earthquakes happening you know, every day. There's a handful of earthquakes around the world. Many of them too small to, to see or whatever, but these things are happening all the time. And so if we deploy our seismometers on our volcano, we can record those earthquakes that are happening all over the world. Right? And even you might not feel it, very, very sensitive bits of equipment, we can record the ground motion from those earthquakes. And what we look for is how that sound, that sound wave energy, as it travels to our station, how does that interact with the ground? directly beneath our station. Ergo, what's it doing within the magma chamber, within the crust, beneath our volcano? So a bit like a doctor uses a CT scan, we can try and build up an image of what's inside the volcano. Um, now the tech, I'm not going to go into this in much detail, but the technique uses something called receiver functions and really what this does is it looks for a certain type of energy that converts at major boundaries within the okay? or how it bounces around within layers. So the simplest one is if you have a crust and a mantle below, okay? and energy will bounce around. And we can look at how um, strong that energy is, we can look at um, and it tells us something about how the, site, the velocities and how fast that material travels through uh, changes. And so if it's slow material, you might think it's molten or hot. And if it's fast, then it might be colder, denser material. Okay. And what we look for in particular is, well, I'll talk about that in, in a second. Now, it's important to note that much of this work was done by our Korean colleagues. Right, and so they came to London uh, in 2015 for a month. Spent a month, I was at Imperial at the time, um, and a bit of time in Cambridge, and we worked on this data together, and it led to the first paper coming out from uh, Rik Yong Song. This is Rik Yong Song presenting this at the Royal Society. The first ever engagement between the, uh, the Royal Society and North Korea. Um, and they've been back since a number of times, including spending some time here at Birkbeck uh, working with them. So what can we do with, with this data? One of the things we look for is something called the P-wave to S-wave velocity ratio. Right? Now again, I'm not going to go into this in much detail. It's a parameter that we can extract from the data. And what it allows us to do is it tells us something about the composition of a rock. And we can go from rocks down here, which is kind of continental crust, right? So normal crust in the case of 
uh, like PEC2, which has no VPS ratios, up to things that are much more bulk okay, that have higher numbers. So just keep that in mind. Uh, what this plot here shows is a profile running pretty much east-west along our array. This is the topography, so you can get a sense this is the Mount PEC2 sits about here, and this is the VPBS ratios that we measure. And lo and behold, rather unsurprisingly, as you go closer to the volcano, these numbers get higher. Right? Well, that's maybe not that big a surprise. We get more volcanic material as we get closer to the volcano. Right? That's not going to get you the, uh, the, 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 the Nobel Prize. But what we see in terms of the numbers is we see VPBS ratios up around here that we can't explain with any kind of rock type. Right? There isn't a rock that exists that would give us such high numbers. So what we have to do is we invoke fluid flows. There has to be some fluid present within the crust, likely distributed throughout. So imagine like a sponge that contains water. Right? The crust kind of appears a bit like that, saying that there must be that fluid component there today. Right, so so this, just, this result is telling us that directly beneath the volcano, anything in this range has to be fluid there today. Right? So it's kind of supporting the idea that magma and melt and molten rock is present beneath the volcano. So, but we can take this a little bit further. So what I've just described to you today gives us one answer per seismic station. Right? So we've got a seismic station here. We can estimate what this EPBS ratio and tell you something about the composition of the rock. We can tell you about how much fluid is there. I can also tell you how thick the, the crust is. But in reality, what's actually happening is earthquakes happen from all around the world and we record them at our seismic station. Okay? And these blue dots are actually telling me where in the crust I'm sampling. Okay? So I'm not actually ever sampling directly beneath my station. I'm sampling at these blue um, dots. And so I can try to, rather than make some single point estimate um, at the station, I can try to put the energy back to where it actually came from within the Earth, and I can try and build up a bit more of a coherent Image. And so for a single station I do this, I projected it onto this line, and you can see that now where I see these black peaks, that's showing that I have a, a, an increase in velocity at that depth. Right? So this is where the crust becomes the mountain. Right? So this is the crust part of the earth and then the mountain below. Where I see these grey peaks here, that means there's a velocity reduction. If you imagine you've got a region with more molten rock in it, right, that will have a slower seismic velocity, so you would expect to see something that looks like this. That's for one station. Uh, I could do it for two. I could do it for all of my stations. Right? And what this allows me now to do is to build up an image of what the actual crustal structure looks like beneath this volcano. And so you can see this is the crust of thickness. It's slightly thicker uh, as we go beneath the volcano. But we see this quite big signal here, which is telling me that at these depths, there's a reduction in velocity. At these depths, there's likely something molten. Okay, so we're now putting some constraints on where this molten rock might be within the Earth. And so rather than just saying in this area, somewhere in the crust, there's a lot of molten material, you can start to place the constraints on exactly where in the crust that is. Okay, so this, we, we published this result in 2016, but apart from these two stations here, which we, we, uh, the data was publicly available, uh, we had no real constraints in China. And similar studies have been done in China, but they haven't used any data in North Korea. And in fact, there was very little engagement between North Korea and China on this problem, despite them sharing uh, a common uh, a volcano, a common problem. So 
again, there are a lot of discussion, and, and even more so, uh, uh, and a lot of uh, time. We built relationships and trust with the Chinese and the China Earthquake Administration. We signed more agreements, more um, this time uh, working with the British Geological Survey. And we managed to get access to data from these stations within China. And so this is hot off the press. This paper's out for review at the moment. Um, and it represents the first ever cross-border study between, uh, on this volcano, actually. And so we did the similar thing. But now, rather than these profiles stopping at the border, right, we can plot our west east profile, the north south profile, running right the way through. And lo and behold, we see this thickened crust. Right? So that's over millions of years, magma being injected into the crust, and it gets thicker and thicker and thicker. thicker. That's, that's what we're seeing there. And we can start to really place some spatial constraints on where this molten rock is beneath the volcano. And we're seeing it at about seven kilometers depth. Now the big question is, this is a big volcano as well. Right? We have no data coverage here. This is a big volcano. We have no data coverage there. Right? So it's still unclear exactly how far this extends beneath nearby volcanic centers. So that's something we need to work on. So kind of summing up uh, now, I'd just like to emphasize that really through this flexible approach, building networks, and importantly, just facilitating communication and building trust with our Korean colleagues both ways. Right? So not just us developing trust in our Korean colleagues, but Korean colleagues <coughs> developing trust in us and understanding what our motivations are. We've developed these strong collaborations with these North Korean scientists. And that's going from 2011, 2011 up to now, and uh, we're, still, we're just about to submit new proposals to do more work together. We've imaged beneath the volcano, shown the presence of melt, and by working also with our Chinese colleagues, we've now extended that to really starting to place the first constraints on where that is in the volcano. Things I haven't talked about, we uh, work that Kayla Yakovino did and Kim Ji Song um, constrained the amount of gases that were released, actually showing that potentially this may have released more sulfur than Tambora, but that's right at the upper scale because it didn't seem to have a big climatic effect when it erupted. So there's a bit of a Something puzzling there that we really need to, to understand a bit better. And as I briefly mentioned, we've absolutely dated the millennium up to 946. Uh, in fact, we think November 946, um, uh, <laughs> which allows us to go in and look at historical records. And we, we're hoping we can get down to the, the day that it might have happened. But there's much, much more work to do, and we're, we're continuing to do this. And just a few closing thoughts, really, is that, you know, this work is really, um, you know, building these relationships has allowed us to really try and push this forward. So we've been holding a number of meetings since we, re we removed the stations in August 2015, uh, but we've been holding regular meetings. So this is a meeting in China um, on the Chinese side of the volcano, attended by South Korean scientists as well, North Korean scientists. Chinese scientists to discuss regional collaboration. Um, we organized a meeting, part funded by Bekbek, um, in uh, Pyongyang in August 2016, um, where we had about 12 international scientists, again including Chinese scientists at this meeting, to really explore what the next steps of our project were. And then from that, we held a meeting at the Royal Society just last year, where we really honed in, and the proposals are just about to be submitted uh, to NERC for the next stage of the project. You know, and there's these really big questions that are still outstanding. We don't know why the volcano exists. Right? I mean, on that level, we don't understand this volcano. It shouldn't be there, but it is. Right? And the reason we don't know that is because most of the rocks, the long history of volcanism, is in North Korea. So working with our North Korean colleagues who have studied that is what we'd like to do. One of the major hazards associated with volcanism, 
Again, all we know about is this 946 AD eruption. We don't know about any of the other eruptions. Uh, that's not the only one. It's erupted many, many times over the last thousands and tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of years. And we need to understand that frequency. We need to understand, does it have lots of small eruptions and then one big eruption every so often? Or is it lots of these big eruptions? You know, we just don't know that. So we can't say what it might do in the future. And we're hoping to run some new field campaigns uh, going forward. Um, and finally, I mean, given what's, what's happening on the Korean Peninsula, it would be a bit amiss if I didn't at least mention what's happening there. And then earlier on in the talk, I talked about how being a really rapidly changing time in the Korean Peninsula from when we started this project to now. But, you know, in the last sort of two or three months, it's, it's changing on another time scale and in quite unpredictable ways. Right? If you asked me a year ago, um, I didn't, this, this wasn't on the table, but now it is, and things, things are moving, okay? But the important thing is that we don't change, right? Our goals, our scientific goals, we never change them, right? And that gives us that stability that's allowed us to continue through all of these tensions and through these changes. And the reason we've, we've developed these strong relationships built on trust and mutual understanding, right? And I think if, these kind of processes are going to have a chance, then those kind of relationships need to be developed right? in terms of trust and understanding of each other. And that's a two-way process. And so maybe, just maybe, science has a role within this in terms of building those relationships. Right? This is a picture from a trip to a pub in Cambridge. Um, you know, and you can see, and this is a, a normal picture for our collaboration. We're good friends who get on well, right? So maybe there is a problem. And so I'll just finish with another little musical interlude. Um, that while we were working there, a new song was written about Mount Pecto. It became a bit of an anthem of our project. And we were invited to a kindergarten school in Pyongyang uh, on one of our trips and they put on a performance of this song uh, for us. So I'll just finish by uh, playing. And this is kind of, if you read this, it really sums up again how important Hector is to the Korean people. 